Hello. So I'm so excited that I get to start out my morning here at City Lab. It's one of my favorite conferences, but particularly with this conversation about culture and art and the people who do that and how that shapes, shapes the lifeblood of a city. So before we get to that, Natalie showed me a quote from a particular paper in New York that was talking about DC. And this is it. I want to read it so I get it correct. Washington can be an isolating and serious place to live sometimes. Considering the steady influx of tourists, the underlying tension of politics, and the residents who come and go, depending on the administration, it's uncommon to meet a Washington native. And it takes a lot for Washingtonians to get excited about the same thing. Calling it a fun-loving city would be a stretch. So it feels a little bit like a gift from the media gods, so I'm going to take it, and I want you both to respond to it. Natalie, you want to start? That is high-level trolling for those of us um, who live here, and particularly the GoGo -Go community, because I can't think of anything more fun-loving than GoGo -Go culture. Um, I mean, it's, uh, like you said, high-level trolling. <laughs> but for me, um, someone who's been in GoGo -Go music uh, since I was nine years old, um, that's all it's been for me. It's fun. You know, for a long time before it became business, it was all fun um, from a time where you know, every corner, you know, had a go-go band. Every school had bands and, uh, you know, had all the kids would gather at the go-go. So for me, it's all been fun since I've been living. I'm fourth, fifth, fifth generation in Washingtonian, you know what I mean? So um, to hear that kind of thing is like, like either it's either ignorance or lack of consideration, you know what I mean, to, for the people that have been here for forever. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm not a DC native either. I'm one of these people who came in uh, with the winds. I came in to go to Howard University in 1994, but I listened, I noticed, I watched people, I read books. You know, I could learn that there's a whole world um, of, of go go that's here. And when I was on Saturday, I was in an event at the Georgetown Library where we were talking about uh, this topic. and. Um, met a, 12th, a, a gentleman who was a huge GoGo -Go fan, 12th generation Washingtonian on his mother's side, on his father's side, 16th generation Washingtonian on his uh, mother's side. Wow. So they exist, they're here, <laughs> they're having lots of fun, and... Um, we've been here. <laughs> yeah, we've been here, yes. So now I want to dig into the idea of GoGo -Go and how it meets DC and the community and how things are changing the communities and what that means for GoGo. -Go. Mm -hmm. Natalie, you were a part of Don't Mute DC, um, which was a petition that went out after there was a <laughs> incident that is now pretty infamous in DC where a resident at a nearby condo wanted the music at a Metro PCS on 7th Street in Shaw shut down. They wanted them to not play their music so loud anymore and the music that they were playing was go go. Mm -hmm. And this inspired a lot of passionate response and went on for several months. Natalie, I want to I want you to talk us through why people felt so deeply about that situation and kind of your work around it. Yeah, so it was sort of like it, it was so on the nose, you know, that it was this particular corner, which is uh, where U Street begins, historically the segregated part of DC. Um, you know, Black people did not choose to be put there, um, but segregation sort of determined that. Um, and, but yet there's all this amazing life there. You know, Langston Hughes wrote about it. Um, he wrote about the songs of 7th Street, you know, and how they inspired his poetry. And you had Duke Ellington that played on that, on that strip, and Chuck Brown, and you had the Howard Theater. And so there's like this rich cultural tradition that's been under attack in the last, you know, 20 years really since gentrification has sort of been picking up. And so it was sort of like one of these last stand things. So I created this petition with Ronald Moten and it got 80,000 signatures, Don't Mute DC Music and Culture. And it really sort of has, you know, is like there's a fierce defense of the music that was born here, um, but also just the whole way of life. I mean, you're talking about a city that they, 20,000 black Washingtonians have been documented to have been pushed out of DC you know, in a very short amount of time. So it became, it's about the music, but then it's so much more. Yeah. yeah. And it was almost like a call and cry, you know what I mean? It, was, it gave uh, the music a shot in the arm um, during that time because, I mean, like you said, we have so many people that grew up on the music, um, be, being it born here, um, and have basically their whole lives built around the go-go, you know what I mean? It's not traditionally 
the word that most people outside of here can gravitate to or recognize what it means. But the go-go is, just to give a quick history, um, you know, 1976, around 77, Chuck Brown infused what we call uh, funk, disco, and jazz. And, you know, traditionally, when you had a show or you had a concert or a party, the DJ would spin a song, people would dance, the song, the song would stop, and he'll put another record on. Um, and, and it gave people a chance to really go sit down. So Chuck Brown started playing top 40 music, and in between songs, he would just play a beat. And the pocket beat would give us a chance to dance while he's switching or while he's transitioning the songs. And so it became go-go music because it kept going and going and going and going. <laughs> and, you know, and so um, you know, 40 years later, we're still going and going and going. And I've been doing it professionally now for the last 20 years. Um, and so for, for us, it was a way of life. It was a part of DC culture. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's the forgotten part almost up until they started the Don't Mute DC campaign. It's been the, really the forgotten music along with the forgotten people that have been here for you know, so many generations. And with, uh, with so many you know, black folk being put, pushed out of the city through you know, financial means or what have you, it's become sort of our calling cry, the go-go music it's really our stamp of we're still here, you know what I mean? So um, it's, it's been a rough ride, but it's, it's a ride worth taking. Well, I was going to say, so you are from a long lineage of go-go royalty. Mm -hmm. How did it feel for this moment to bubble up and be centered around basically a criticism of trying to stop and silence go-go music in particular? What did that feel like having been a seven, uh, sixth, fifth generation? Fifth generation, yeah. Washington, D.C. native. Um, it's, it's really been a sign of the times. It's, it's like a microcosm and a macrocosm. It's really the small thing that represents the big thing that's going, over, that's going on all around the country, really. You know what I mean? Um, the inner cities, uh, like you said, black people didn't choose to be here. Um, Washington, D.C., historically, was one of the places, was the hub for a lot of African Americans to be able to be free during a time when we weren't able to be free in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, when we became... Washingtonians, it was, you know, it was nicknamed Chocolate City for a reason. You know, it was uh, predominantly black. And, you know, th there was a, a culture of, you know, socializing in bars and clubs. And the music became our unifying kind of source of pride. Um, and even to this day, you know, you go somewhere, kids go to college, they hear go-go music, and they're like, what you know about that DC stuff? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it becomes a a sense of, um, it's really the icebreak in a lot of conversations when you come from this area. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to add to that, um, it was, you know, he, he said that it was a place that people came to be free, and that's quite literally, you know, mm -hmm. during the Civil War, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation came to D.C. nine months before it came to the rest of the country. Yep. And so the line, you know, D.C. is this diamond shape. So if you crossed over from Maryland or Virginia and you crossed over that D.C. line, you literally were free. You know, and so you had tens of thousands of people who came to the um, former enslaved people who came into D.C. And, you know, you had institutions like Howard University, uh, where I teach, that sort of have been a beacon, you know, for people see seeking freedom. You know, and so it's not a secret that, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's not surprising that something like GoGo -Go would sort of come out of that because it's also, you know, as he mentioned, it's, it's a way of life. I mean, it's a whole, you know, I talk about GoGo -Go in my book as being a collection of black-owned businesses. And so Don Campbell, who owned the Metro PCS store um, at the corner of uh, 7th Street and um, Florida Avenue, he was sort of one of those businesses that people have been, you know, aside from the musicians, yeah. you know, you have the people who sell the music, people who promote the music, people who own the clubs, people who promote the clubs, sound engineers, you have mm -hmm. f affiliated fashion industry that came out of go-go music. So it's a whole economy that sort of has allowed DC in its really most challenging times when there wasn't a lot of the surpluses in the budgets and there wasn't a lot of uh, economic investment, it really is something that allowed people to survive in DC. So when it's under attack, you're gonna hear something about that. <laughs> yeah. How do you think that the gentrification of DC, the pushing out of some of the black families who have lived here for generations, how do you think that's affecting the culture as it pertains to music, to go-go, to art? How is it changing the culture of DC? Well, um, so, so 
loaded question. <laughs> um, when I come, when I was coming up, we had a farm system. You know what I mean? We had a a feeder a feeder system where music was prevalent in schools. Um, musicians were being bred, so to speak. Um, I went to a school where, you know, we had one of the best bands, Eastern Senior High School, prior to Capitol Hill. We had one of the best marching bands, Eastern in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, and we had, uh, of course, with Duke Ellington, but all of the, um, most of the D.C. public schools back then had a music program. And it was, it was basically feeding the go-go community um, with, you know, so many pe people being pushed out. Uh, the feeder program is called, sort of stopped, you know what I mean? So it's affected the, the long-term growth of the music and not really having, you know, like I said, I've been in since I was nine years old. I aspired to be you know, like the guys I've watched at block parties and clubs and, you know, that kind of thing. But now, um, the kids don't really have that interest in playing live music like they had when I was a kid. And so, with the gentrification part of it, you know, it all, it's all about budgets, it's all about the interests of the people. And, you know, D.C. is a transient town, it's a, it's a political town, you know, for, on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with, with their kids, with people that come into the city to live, with their kids, they have their own interests, you know what I mean? And so they might not be into what we were into as kids as far as what, what's already been here, as far as the culture of D.C. And so I think it's, it's really on us and a lot of people that, that come here to really get, you know, want to be acclimated, want to learn, you know, want to uh, learn about our culture so we can start that feeder program again, you know what I mean? So we can continue to have just people want to be into the music. Natalie, when you showed me that quote earlier, one of the first questions I had was, how could it be that people legitimately feel like they have never met anyone who is a DC native? When I go home every night, I know both my neighbors, 90% of my block are multi-generational households and are folks who have been here mm -hmm. for generations. It is wild to me that people could be here for a period of time and feel like they don't know anyone who's a DC native. How do you think these discrepancies between what we know to be the actual culture and history of DC and what people are saying about DC, how does that gap happen? So it's sort of like, so a lot of neighborhoods have actually become more integrated because of gentrification than ever. And so, you know, it is possible to have somebody who, you're a New York native, right? Yep. So you could be sandwiched by two DC natives. And that's actually happening in a lot of neighborhoods now. Um, but maybe what might be different with you is you might have a conversation with your neighbor. You know, maybe you uh, hang out on the porch in the front and have, you know, informal conversations. Maybe you say hello to them. You know, a lot, that's the traditional culture of DC. It's very Southern, you know, it's a lot of porch, you know, a lot of sidewalk conversations. And um, so a lot of newcomers aren't acclimated to that. And so they maybe they, they miss out. And so they really, they just miss out. Like they miss out on learning on, you know, on the incredible culture that's here. Um, and then it also just sort of speaks to how hyper segregated DC is and how many cities are. You know, you, you're sort of, even in the gentrifying areas, you're just sharing air, you know, you're not actually in a community living together, mm -hmm. you, know, you know. In in my neighborhood, I mean, you find a lot of people, they'll, you know, they might have a, like a garage that they come in through, you know, and so they're sort of like rushing to get inside, or you have a lot of high rises where there's like, maybe there's your pool top, and so like they have these whole worlds that don't interact with the street, you know, and so, and then you sort of compound the other segregation, like at schools, which Frank mentioned, schools hyper-segregated. So the kids aren't going to school together. Uh, workplaces hyper-segregated. Restaurants hyper-segregated. Uh, nightlife hyper-segregated. So, you know, it's totally possible for you to be living in D.C. and have no idea that there is this amazing culture. And you know what? They're just missing out, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you said that, when you said just sharing the same air, it reminded me of another incident that happened in Shaw where residents started taking their dogs um, to Howard University and allowing them to use the bathroom on the yard, which is considered a pretty sacred space for Howard University. Um, and it ended up in kind of a big battle in the neighborhood where there was one person in particular who said, well, if they don't like it, they should move the school. <laughs> Which is a wild thing to say. Like the audacity, like how do you, you know what Yeah. I mean? The school was established in 1867. <laughs> so I'm wondering when you have that level of kind of divisiveness and lack of understanding, especially in a neighborhood like 
Shaw and talking about a DC monument like Howard and neighbors who are new saying, I don't feel any respect or reverence for this mm -hmm. thing at all. Yeah. How do you bridge that gap? Well, some of the things that we've been doing, so by the way, I, I don't live too far from there, and one of my neighbors actually said they saw that, that person who, he's still walking his dog, you know, not necessarily on campus, but he's still walking the dogs, and he's still, um, you know, doing his thing. But um, one of the things we've been doing at Howard, we got a small grant from Humanities DC to do um, some forums called Communicating Across Culture. Um, we do, we're doing sort of discussions between where we're really specifically trying to get longtime residents and newer residents in the same room. Um, we're ending all of our discussions with GoGo, <laughs> with live GoGo, which, you know, is, again, it's a privilege if you try to, you know, and, so, and you all are about to be privileged because Frank is about to bless you all with some, <laughs> some GoGo music too. But, you know, that's part of, you know, like, it has to be intentional. Like, it's not something, like, people won't get on the sidewalk without some sort of intervention, you know, and so, like, there has to be intentional efforts on the part of, uh, community organizations, you know, institutions to so, sort of say, look, we're going to try to do better. We can do better, and we're going to try to do better. Mm -hmm. Frank, how are you thinking about trying to get go go music out there to keep it ingrained in DC culture, um, even as the city is changing? I'd like to see a curriculum in schools, um, uh, history classes uh, taught, you know, culture, um, you know, city history. I think it should be a part of it, you know what I mean? Uh, it's a big part of our culture for a long time, and it's, uh, I think it should be in schools. That's one, reason, one thing I think we should have. And also, I think we should get back to doing block parties, and yes. you know what I mean, having a good time, man. I, I mean, that's what it was built around. That's what it's centered around, centered around um, socializing, having people come together. And music has always been a universal source of you know, community. Um, and in that, we should have our community listen, our, listen to our community music. You know, whether you're black, white, brown, purple, it doesn't matter. You know, go-go music is a part of the city's fabric. And um, if you're here, we should, you know, not force it down your throat, but at least give it a try. You know <laughs> what I mean? So uh, more, more community events um, centered around go-go music. Um, and I, I can't stress it enough. We need more kids involved in playing live music you know, with the digital age, we're losing a lot of musicians. Well, I was going to say, part of the struggle that cities are having across the country, especially in public schools, are the loss of music programs. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about how before that next generation of go-go musicians was coming from schools. There was kind of like a feeder program. Yep. Where are the next generation of go-go musicians coming from now? Uh, I mean, it's, it's scarce. You know, um, and it's scary to think that DC can have a generation, a whole generation, miss out on being able to play for people and giving them joy through live music. Um, I, I don't have an answer for where they're coming from now. Yeah. Um, I, like, I like to change the narrative you know, that we have now that there are no feeder programs. I like to start a feeder program, you know what I mean? But it's you know, budget, money, that kind of thing uh, is really a helpful situation. Yeah, and that's the whole thing with budget and money. And so, I, you know, this is what I'm hoping comes out of Don't Mute DC, mm -hmm. is that I don't want to hear that excuse. Mm -hmm. DC had five, something like $500 million more in, in revenues last year than they had the year before. You know, like it's taken off like a rocket. And so I'm really not trying to hear that they don't have money for music in schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is one of the... Um, one of the opportunities I think that there are, so on Wednesday there's going to be a hearing, uh, Councilman Kenya McDuffie sponsored legislation to make DC the official music of Washington DC. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where I think, you know, one of the our opportunities are to, for us to sort of like remind people what the fabric of this city is, what the fabric of this country is, you know, is this um, the African uh, culture that has, you know, survived uh, so much and is sort of sur uh, thriving in the city. And so that means, I think that DC being the official music, Go-Go uh, being the official music of DC means that, that means music is back in the school. That means that it's expanding programs. Um, there's a program called Teach the Beat that a, a organization called Teaching for Change has been doing for the last few years, where they bring musicians, and some of the musicians that will be performing tonight mm -hmm. have been going in schools, but it's been a very small scale uh, operation, and so you know, we're hoping that there's gets more resources for that. 
Um, and you know, mostly, like I'm hoping that with this legislation, it means that it won't be a secret so much anymore. We will not get these ignorant, you know, uh, commentaries from you know these New York papers yeah. um, saying things about <laughs> DC. Yeah. And I don't think like a paper like that or, or a comment like that would be made about you know New Orleans and their food and their music. I mean, DC, is, go go to DC is what you know, gumbo is to New Orleans, or what reggae is to Jamaica, you know what I mean? Or hip hop is to New York. It's like, this is the mecca of go-go music. Um, and it's been around for 40, over 40 years. And it's crazy that we just getting that, you know, go-go is the official music of DC, like we just getting that legislation yeah. to be able to push that bill through. Um, to be fair, I don't know any other city, that maybe other people know, are there other, do cities have official music? Unofficially, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if it's ever happened, but you know what? Nowhere else has go-go, which is this, this very unique thing. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and we need these extraordinary measures to try to protect the culture and cement mm -hmm. its place and to sort of direct resources toward it. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that it, uh, you know, we get a good hearing. Well, I think bringing that up, bringing New Orleans up in particular is a good example. Do you think there are other cities that have done a good job, even as they've changed, even as new people have come in, of really preserving the culture there and kind of integrating new people into that versus that culture being bulldozed by whatever the new folks want? Absolutely. You get off the plane in New Orleans, you're going to see trombones and trumpets, and tambourines, you know what I mean? You're going... You get off the plane in Jamaica, you hear reggae music. Um, I wanted to be like that for DC. When you get off the plane in DC, that's the first thing you see, you know, the Washington Nationals and go-go, you know what I mean? Yes. So uh, I, think it's, I think it's very important. Well, I think also with New Orleans, we had, with Don't Mute DC, we had an event um, a f last month called Don't Mute DC Meets Don't Mute NOLA because they actually picked up the hashtag over there when a musician was arrested. Um, <laughs> on Frenchman Street, unbelievably. Um, and they also have been dealing with issues of gentrification and cultural erasure, even though, you know, music is their brand and they're still dealing with some of the same um, displa black displacement issues. And so, you know, I think, that, so they're doing a better job of, they, they've done a better job. Like, it's not a secret that jazz is, and music is a big thing in New Orleans, or gumbo is yeah. a big thing in New Orleans. So they've, they've done a better job of, like, integrating into the city's branding. So I think um, D.C. can sort of learn from that. You know, cities mm -hmm. like Memphis and Austin, Texas, even Nashville. Chicago. Yeah, they, they have, like, they, it's not a secret that these are, like, fun-loving places. Yeah. Um, so I think that they, we could learn from those places, but I think they also can learn from us because DC is sort of like, I think maybe San Francisco, right? Well, well definitely San Francisco is farther along as far as like the gentrification path. Um, but there's, we've had a lot of neglect as far as like preventing and protecting the native population here. Uh, but we still have some resources and there's still things to protect here. And so the, what happens in the next year with our city is gonna be really important in determining whether there is a place for DC residents or in D native Washingtonians and their culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Final lightning round question. If there's one thing that you could get from city government, from neighbors, from community leaders to kind of preserve DC culture, what would it be? Natalie, we're starting with you. <laughs> <laughs> One thing? One thing. I like a challenge question. Yeah. Um, I hate to put it all on one thing, but I do think that the legislation on Wednesday is a start. Let's make, DC, let's make Go Go the official music of DC. And let's not just say it, let's actually put some resources behind it to support Frank, support, uh, you know, musicians going into schools, mm -hmm. support research around it, you know, have the go-go, have conga players at the airport, yeah. you know, and at <laughs> Union Station. I mean, we, we can do this. Yeah. So I think that's one thing. Frank? I want to see a go-go band made up of only councilmen and mayors. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the perfect place to close this out. Natalie, Frank, thanks so much. And you guys are in for a treat now with the Chuck Brown Band. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.